All right, guys, this next guest is undoubtedly the voice of MMA. Uh, he is elite when it comes to commentating and bringing fights to live in people's homes. One of the men behind the Anik Florian podcast, which recently celebrated 500 episodes, by the way. Our good, uh, my good friend, John Anik, is on Submission Radio. John, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Always a pleasure. I know sometimes our schedules don't align. I'm very much aligned with your Boston Celtics sweatshirt. <laughs> and thank you for the shout out on the Anakin Florian podcast. I don't know how many of those hundreds of episodes Kenny Florian was actually paid to do, but we're still trucking little engine that could. And, uh, you know, it's therapeutic for me to have that show after pay-per-views to be sure. But it's always good to be with you, especially when you're wearing that Celtic Kelly green. <laughs> Dude, uh, I love it. It's, it connects us, the Celtics green. There's nothing like it. The Olympics on right now. It's great to see the boys doing well in Australia, putting up a good fight as well. Let's get into the fights though, man, because you're on the heels of another incredible commentating job uh, at UFC 304. I got to ask you, how does it feel to now sort of be able to look back on it and um, for Bilal to be able to claim this gold after the long journey that he's had and I suppose you, in a lot of ways, being able to witness the journey up close, but also, you know, through your podcast, through your conversations, through the relationship you guys have been able to build over all these years. Well, certainly it's a celebration for Team Muhammad, his friends and family who knew that he could do this. And I've always said that he leads the league in self-belief, but you need to get the opportunity. And I think for him, it really wasn't until Dana White announced the fight on Instagram that he really felt like, all right, I have this shot. And uh, even if I'm on one leg, I'm going to show up in Manchester, England. But I couldn't be happier for him. And, uh, you know, largely it dovetails with a lot of what I've said. The most special part of this job for me is when guys like Brandon Moreno and Jan Bojovic and Glover Teixeira, non-UFC champions, break through for the first time and effectively change their lives forever. You know, Glover Teixeira broke through at 42 years of age and heretofore he's never introduced other than former UFC light heavyweight champion and future UFC Hall of Famer Glover Teixeira. So Bilal changed his life forever. And if you know the athlete's backdrop, you know he was only going to be given one chance to do so. So with an entire country and all of the Palestinian Americans sort of on his back, he broke through and had a championship performance that uh, that is worthy of being the undisputed UFC welterweight champion. And if you look at the lineage of that title, a lot of big effing names, my man. And, uh, you know, there's nothing interim about it. Bilal is undisputed. And I think even Leon Edwards and his team would acknowledge that he deserves to be such as we sit here uh, in August of 2024. Yeah, man, I, it was a really beautiful story uh, watching the countdown, seeing um, you know, the little boy that he brought down uh, and uh, the, the Palestinian community and everybody behind him. It was really beautiful. You did a really good job, man, commentating that fight. Like, it was very balanced. You brought in amazing insight. Um, I always feel lucky when I get a chance to watch you do your thing because, you Thank know, you, you're just so great at it. But deep down inside, in your heart of hearts, what was going on in there as you saw Bilal do what many people thought could not be done, and that is beat Leon Edwards as the rounds ticked on. What was going on in your brain and in your heart? So as Bilal knows, I did, did not like this matchup for him. I don't even <laughs> still love it for him, if I'm being totally honest, right? Even if I look at some of the grappling situations in which Leon felt strong or looked strong and he was able to reverse Bilal, obviously in that fifth round and in a prior round as well. So if I had to send one welterweight in there in the world right now to beat Bilal Muhammad with respect to Shavkat Rachmanov and Ian Machado Gary and Sean Brady and everybody else, Jack Della Maddalena, I still think Leon's the toughest matchup for Bilal, so I give him a shit ton of credit for going into the belly of the beast on the road at whatever hour, and that's really the thing about Bilal, and all hail Islam Akasha, the pound-for-pound -pound king, but let us be clear, Bilal Muhammad will train through Ramadan, compete during Ramadan if need be, take on all these undefeated guys in short order. That's the type of champion the UFC now has on their hands. So, yeah, amazing to watch him break through, especially what I felt like was the, the magnitude of this particular Leon Edwards challenge. And I will say in terms of the personal connected tissue, it's very gratifying for us as an Anakin Florian podcast family, having built a show around Bilal in 2020 when he had 18,000 Instagram followers and was an unranked welterweight to see him rise to the top. But the Anakin Florian podcast show open every week ends with Leon Edwards saying, you know, headshot dead. So uh, Leon is a huge fabric point in my career. And I have so much respect for Team Edwards as a whole. And uh, 
you know, I know Leon says he's going to get this one back in blood. I, I do believe that their paths will cross at some point uh, in the not too distant future. When was the last time that you felt this way during a fight? Like when you've had this kind of connection with a fighter and when you had this kind of emotion going on in your heart as, as, as you're doing an amazing job commentating and you obviously can't tell through the broadcast, yeah. but deep down inside, you're like, holy shit, what, what is going on here? Well, they're all different. I mean, certainly when the athlete hits the tunnel, I try to remove a lot of that from the equation, right? Like if you look at the way I was, you know, sucking Jan Bohovic's dick when he won the title, it's not <laughs> dissimilar to the way I'm celebrating Bala Muhammad right now. I think people just fixate upon this because of his relationship with my twin brother. You know, yes, there's a lot of personal connection there. Yes, Bilal is like family, but once he hits that tunnel, that relationship is thrown out the window. And am I as close with Bilal as someone like Dominic Cruz? No. So having had to call Dominic Cruz fights, that's a unique challenge as well. This one just had a lot of interpersonal to it because of my twin brother. But, uh, you know, I do believe I'm able to compartmentalize and throw those things out and uh, objectively call these fights. And uh, you can be sure, you know, the day that I'm not able to do so, I'll get a call from Craig Borsari, my boss, or Zach Candido, one of my other bosses, or Dana White will get word to me in an indirect way. So uh, word hasn't come in yet. I stand by the call as I do most of these. And, uh, you know, I love both the athletes. Oftentimes there's a relationship on both sides of the fight, and that was certainly the case at UFC 304. Dude, your call was great. There's no need to even – I saw some people online were saying <clears throat> you're biased or some, or some shit, and you were saying, um, you know, you'll check it out, but, you know – Huh. You, you watch it back but come on yeah. man i uh, you 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 are the glue i think uh in mma commentary i have to pay you a compliment man you are the glue that makes uh combinations work teams work and brings things to life so you did an incredible job yet again and i don't know how you do it in the middle of the morning at five in the morning <laughs> in england but uh you did you pulled it off and you did an incredible job doing that now speaking of Bilal as champion though what do you yeah. what are what are some of the matchups that you're most excited about during this Bilal reign over the welterweight division. Couple of fights you so, can mention for me. So he's going to fight Sha Shavkat Rachmanov next, unless I got blinders on and the UFC is going to go in some opposite direction. It's going to be the undefeated, the finishing machine, the deserving, the worthy Shavkat Rachmanov. He's all the rage with the fan base, as you know. You know, he brought me chocolates from Kazakhstan. He's a super <laughs> humble genuine guy and that sort of transcends the language barrier that says nothing of how great a fighter and potential champion he could be I think before mid-november for Bilal uh is, is just way too idealistic and ambitious but beyond that i felt like maybe depending on the leon Bilal result you could do shabka rachmanov against ian machado gary i think that fight is probably on hold i think ian machado gary potentially waiting in the wings if sean brady is able to get past gilbert Dorino burns his name could be called in the not too distant future. The Bilal result was huge for Sean Brady, the man who took his O. I think Jack Della Maddalena is going to factor prominently in this equation. He's on the mend right now. It's very exciting. But one thing that I do bring as far as Muhammad insight is that he's going to defend the belt. And, uh, you know, knock on wood, he's been pretty fudging durable, as he would say. And he wants to be challenged and challenge himself against all of these guys. You know, he's not going to be bouncing divisions. He's ready to go and defend. And uh, hopefully that can happen as soon as Madison Square Garden in mid-November. What do you think is it about his skill set that fans are kind of like, I feel like sometimes people underplay his skill set, right? Like they, uh, he, he's a constant sort of underdog to a lot of people or they can't really get behind what he brings into the octagon. What is something that they're missing here that you believe is going to keep that belt around his waist for a long, lot longer than what people are thinking? Thank you for asking the question about the mixed martial arts because it's his jab, it's his boxing, it's his wrestling, it's his commitment in totality to the cause and mixed martial arts improvement. Not really unlike Alex Pereira, who really has been focused on skill development in a short amount of time. I mean, think about what Bilal Muhammad was able to do with the 15 months between the Gilbert Burns fight and the fight against Leon Edwards. Just amazing skill development. But yeah, I mean, I think you see a strength and conditioning commitment that allows him 
to have this wrestling based pressure style. You see a lot of nuances to his takedown game, not unlike a Khabib Nurmagomedov or an Islam Makashev. His ability to just sustain in terms of the endurance as people like Kenny Florian comparing him to George St. Pierre. There's a lot of different things at play. But I leave with the boxing because that's really what people aren't talking about. And I, it doesn't behoove Leon Edwards to get on a hot microphone and say, Bilal Muhammad stunned me on the feet in round one. Um, but I believe that might have happened. So I think that Horacio Gutierrez and Mike Valley and Lewis Taylor, all these guys who aren't getting credit several days later, you know, thankfully we got guys like you asking the right questions. So guys like me can talk about the skills because, uh, you know, it's a wide ranging answer, as you can see. Yeah, man. And sometimes that belt and the momentum and the timing in your skill set and the time that you spend on the mats all comes together for an incredible championship reign. And we saw that with Leon and we're going to see it, I think, with Bilal. Just quickly, you mentioned Islam. What do you think happens with him next, man? Because we were talking to Javier uh, Mendez a few times. I spoke to Javier. He mentioned that Islam really wanted to go to welterweight. Obviously, now it's not going to happen because he's mates with Bilal. What do you think the future holds for Islam? Well, a title defense against Armand Sarukian, which at least from my vantage point sounds like no picnic. But gosh, man, like I don't know that any performance in 2024 is going to top what Islam Akasha was able to do against Dustin Poirier, right? Mm. Championship on the line, potentially getting that takedown and that submission against that dude in that round. What else can you say? Uh, speaking of his team, though, man, I want to look look at Umar for a second because that guy had an incredible performance against Corey Sanhagen. <laughs> you all right, John? You all good, brother? Yeah, dude, I've been battling. Yeah, I've been battling a cold, but we're good. Yeah, man. Thank no, you. we're good. We got a mute button, so we're good. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Uh, I'm just talking about Umar and Umagomedov, man. He had an incredible performance against Corey Sanhagen, another person that had a chance to work with Islam and the amazing team there. Got to get your thoughts, man. What did you make of this incredible performance from Umar? We saw some uh, some wrinkles in the striking there as well. Some nice nice uh, new uh, little wrinkles in his skill set. And ultimately, who do you think he'll be fighting for the title? Do you believe it's going to be Sean or Marab? So that's a tricky question. I will tell you right now, Marab Dwalishwili is the betting favorite to win the Bantamweight Championship, which is about six weeks from right now. So... As the guy who's calling the fight, I can't give you the direct answer to that question, but I will take you to something that Corey Sandhagen said on the Anakin Florian podcast this week. You know, he just doesn't expect that Marab is going to be able to, like, dominate Sean or get him out of there quickly. Umar is, like, one of the most impressive human beings, fighters that I've met in any walk of life, right? His ability to connect with people in English already is insane relative to what it was like 24 months ago. And he's always banging on himself in terms of his ability to speak English. He's fantastic. Uh, he'll be favored against Sean or Marab. I feel pretty convicted in saying that. I just don't think a lot of guys will be able to dominate Corey Sanhagen in that way with respect to Corey and, you know, my kids distracting me. I gave Umar all five rounds. So uh, impressed doesn't even begin to describe it. A guy that was actually supposed to fight Khabib that couldn't really do it, unfortunately, last second was Tony Ferguson. And I want to bring Tony Ferguson up because we saw him lay one glove down in the octagon this past weekend and say he was going to retire. He then went on to the UFC uh, post-fight thing and said that he has work to do, so he's not retiring. But um, I just want to go talk about Tony Ferguson for two secs. First off, if that could be fight would have happened with the Tony, that version of Tony Ferguson back then, do you think Tony could have been the one to take that, to take that record from Khabib? Great question. You always bring the hard hitting questions and far be it from me to suggest that he couldn't. And I could give you some long winded ans answer thereafter, but these guys, as your listenership likely knows, were booked to fight five times. 15, 16, 17, 18, 20, right? 20, 15, 16, 17, 18, 20. It never happened. Yes, I think a prime Tony Ferguson presents a lot of different problems to Khabib Nurmagomedov. But answering that question in 2024 is a little bit harder to do when you look at the, uh, the rainbow-colored nature of Tony Ferguson's Wikipedia page, bro. I mean, it is indeed crazy to see 12 green stripes followed by eight red stripes. And I do hope that we just put Tony Ferguson in the Hall of Fame. And I know every individual case is hard to judge, especially when it comes to the way the UFC Hall of Fame works. I've hosted the Hall of Fame ceremony 13 years. It's a little clunky. 
But uh, yeah, I think that's the direction with Tony is put him in the Hall of Fame. And uh, I just don't know that there's really any fight at 55 or 70 that the UFC is going to have some huge appetite to make right now. All right, guys, before we continue in the interview, I have a sponsorship announcement that you're going to want to hear, and that is with our friends from Manscaped who are offering you 20% off and free shipping right now with the code word submission. Listen to me. I know submission radio has you sorted when it comes to your MMA coverage, but these guys have you sorted when it comes to your bowl coverage. The Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra is an absolute game changer. It comes with two interchangeable skin-safe blade heads, so you can choose between a precise trim or a smooth finish. And did I mention that it is water? Waterproof. Yes, you can trim in the shower and avoid making a mess everywhere. It's perfect for those of us who appreciate efficiency. And let's talk about the beard hedger just quickly. Whether you're going for a neat stubble or a full-on lumberjack look, this trimmer has you covered. It features a titanium-coated stainless steel T-blade and 20 length options. You can achieve any style you want with just a twist of the zoom wheel. The Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra always ensures that you're looking your best below the waist while the Beard Hedger takes care of everything else. 20% off and code word submission now, plus free shipping. Now back to the program. Yeah, it's a hard one, right? Because with Tony, he's the guy that literally bled for the UFC. Um, you know, during COVID times, he had that fight with Justin Gaethje and he just kind of made stuff happen for the organization. And now he's in this position where, you know, like he's like, I'm not retiring. Like, I don't want to retire. I want to keep fighting. But at the same time, obviously, and we saw this against Mike Chiesa and we've seen this in his previous fights, he's not quite the same fighter. And it's a position where you just don't want to see him take that kind of damage because you and me have both been in the gyms. We've both met guys that have taken too much damage. And it's really hard to see those guys over the last, you know, next few years in their life. So I wonder... Is, is it like a, a foot down situation where, you know, Tony just does not get another fight in the UFC, in your opinion? Or do you just, because of everything that he's done for the organization, do you just let him ride it out? What do you think, what do you think is the right sort of move with Tony next? Because he's such a legend in the sport, but at the same time, people don't want to see him get damaged, you know, and people don't want to see him get hurt in that octagon. So as we're talking, if you saw me look down at my phone, I was Googling Joe Lozon to make sure that he never fought Tony Ferguson because as, as I sit here and think about opponents that might make sense for Tony to try to realize some sort of success, Joe Lozon still has fights left on his contract and for whatever reason hasn't competed. But I think that fight makes some sense. The first fighter at 155 pounds, what I think is the toughest division, to put a double-digit winning streak on paper. And... You know, I was actually thinking today as I was doing some other UFC stuff about printing a T-shirt with like those 12 names on the back of it mm. for Tony, right? Because of just how amazing that winning streak was. So I don't know, man, like I used to say like, man, I can't believe I'm going to go to my cremation chamber without seeing Tony and Khabib compete in a mixed martial arts setting. Well, hopefully we don't have to wait too long to see Tony go into the Hall of Fame because I don't know. That's really my only solution right now but I don't know if he's going to fight again. Yeah, well, he's got a lot to give to the sport from a coaching perspective. You know, there's grappling yeah. contests, it's all sorts of stuff. So I hope Tony finds some cool stuff to do. And he's done so much for Submission Radio as well. So I just want to, and the fans. So I just want to see the guy uh, land somewhere where he can sort of dig his teeth into something he gets excited about. Another thing I'm excited about, man, and I know you'd be excited about this too, is Dan Hooker just revealed he signed a fight, new five fight deal with the UFC. And Dan Hooker is another guy that fans have absolutely loved over the years. He saved a number of cards. He's become synonymous with fight of the night performances and uh, just taking guys last minute. I got to find out what's your reaction when you saw a couple of days ago, Dan Hooker sticking around in the UFC. And we have this blockbuster fight with Gamera coming up in Perth and he's coming for that title all over again. What was your reaction to that? I love Dan Hooker, man. You know, sometimes it's hard for me to sort of bury the MMA fan. I know Joe Rogan suggests that we are professional fans. But, you know, if Dan Hooker's not my favorite fighter as we sit here in 2024, he's pretty close. And a lot of the, that just has to do with uh, listening to him talk. Obviously, his fighting style is tremendous. But I've had a firsthand look at the way he interacts with fans, the way he resonates with fans. He's had a lot of one-liners, of course, over the years that uh, just a scratch or whatever it is that fans can sort of latch upon. 
but he's a tremendous fighter in a tremendous division that needs guys like him. Health is wealth, right? I mean, this guy has been there and done that, had so many signature wins and fought so many big wins. And yet when he's not doing that, he's either dealing with some COVID circumstance in his country with a fence between him and his daughter, or his arm is in a sling going through some surgery, or maybe he's getting some big tattoo done, right? But I just have so much respect for Dan Hooker. I hope that his fight against Dustin Poirier from June of 2020 goes into the UFC Hall of Fame one day. I hope that his UFC contract, the new one, is uh, is fat. I would imagine it is. And uh, he's breaking it in only in the way Dan Hooker would with a very difficult matchup against Mataj Gamrot. So I tip my hat to uh, the hangman, Dan Hooker. And not only that, a matchup that he wanted. He's been chasing Gamrot for a while. The, yeah. the boogeyman of the division that nobody wants to face. Yeah, he doesn't right. want an easy matchup and he wants that title. So I can't wait for Perth. Just quickly before we wrap up, John, as well. You obviously can't give a prediction on this one because you'll likely be on the call. But how big of a fight is this DDP versus Israel fight that's going to be headlining UFC 305 from your perspective? Because... I think there's a lot of questions to be answered here. A lot more than just a title on the line. Israel's coming back after this fight with uh, Sean Strickland and Sydney, And I think there's a lot for him to show. He looks like he's hungrier than ever. Dan Hooker actually told me that he can't even be bothered sparring Israel at the moment because he's such a beast. And in the gym, his strength and conditioning videos and the fact that he's coming for heads and not titles, it's just a different Israel. And then you've got DDP. And DDP is a guy that is just going to come at you. He's do- he, he knows Israel sets traps. He knows Israel is one of the best counter-strikers that's ever fought in, not MMA, kickboxing, combat sports in general. He's going to be coming for him. And he wants to prove that that title around his waist makes him one of the best middleweight champions of all time with a win over Robert Whitaker already and a stoppage over Robert Whitaker already, which is incredible. So for you, this main event, man, what does it signify? Because there's just so much significance going into this one in Perth. Dude, what do I need to add? You laid it out beautifully. So I was going to sort of lead with at least what I perceive to be this sort of heightened focus and approach and discipline that we're seeing from Israel Adesanya. Obviously, Dan Hooker uh, is giving you a firsthand account of that. So, yeah, not a guy that I would be trying to piss off nor give extra motivation to. Now, that's just the nature, I think, of MMA and a lot of championship level athletes would tell you that if you need that extra motivation at that level, then, uh, you know, maybe you should find a different sport, but my gosh, you can be sure that this has unleashed the best type of beast when it comes to Adesanya's preparation. And yeah, on the other side, he's fighting a dude who's just like a truck and not a human being who just seemingly won't be denied because maybe he's more like machine than man, you know, Duplessis is a fascinating champion. I also think that the nature of this matchup is going to have him just completely locked in. I'm getting excited just talking to you about it. This is the first time I'm really talking about UFC 305. So when you set it up, I'm just uh, getting all this energy. I think as far away as Perth may be from South Florida, which is where I am right now, and it's as far as I can go, it's the hottest ticket when we go there in UFC history, every time we go, it was the last time we were there and uh, it might get topped by the sphere a month later, but barely. So it's just going to be an electric MMA atmosphere when you have an MMA championship matchup like this with friction and skill upon skill, uh, just doesn't get any better. You know that you'll be in the building. Yeah, man. Well, I can't wait to hear you bring, you know, some color to this thing and put, put your voice over it and tell us the journey and the story. Uh, RAC arena is going to blow off its roof when they see, these guys go in and of course guys one of the best in the in the business john anik uh thank you so much for your time dude i know how busy you are with the kids and you have some rare time off make sure to follow john at john underscore anik and of course the anik florian pod one of the best pods in the game man and i know how hard it is to keep these pods going you guys always put out an incredible product i really appreciate all the effort and 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 the skill that goes into uh the stuff that you guys have been putting out man thank you so much for joining me it really means a lot Right back at you, buddy. Always good to chop it up with you. I know sometimes our schedules and time zones make it tricky, but pleasure's on this side of the cameraman, and uh, we'll do it again soon.